A D&D NES game. This? I mean, this looks kinda cozy. Oh my god, are we sure this is easy mode? Dragon Strike is a dragon flight combat game from the early 90s by Westwood Studios. It was produced by SSI, who owned the D&D licensing. Westwood Gaming Dragon... Uh, hold on, haven't we done this video before? Dragon Strike 1990 was a D&D flight simulator based off of the popular Dragonlance setting and novels. In it, you played as a dragon rider who would blast and joust their way through the War of the Lance. Two years later, Westwood ported Dragon Strike to the NES. They called it a port, but it was essentially a completely different game. This time, it's a scrolling top-down shoot-'em-up. Coming out in 92, it predates the bullet hell genre by about a year, and thus it isn't really influenced by that particular genre of shmups. Regardless of genre names though, Dragon Strike sure feels like what I would describe off the cuff as bullet hell. This game is wildly hard. Being that this is more of a mini game than it is a full D&D title, I wasn't originally planning on covering Dragon Strike for the NES. I mean, since we'd already gone over the actual main game last year. But working with today's sponsor put this old loose end back in my brain. And I'm sure glad it did, because NES Dragon Strike was a fun little project. Now the sponsor of this here Dragon Strike video is... Dragon Strike. I, I, I should explain. Dragon Strike is a 1990 title about dragon flight combat. And now, 30 years later, it's back. Dragon Strike, in its new form, is a tabletop strategy game that manages to capture the soul and thrill of the original. It comes to us from Fighting Hedgehog, a small game developer best known for launching the war game Clash of Spears. I've had the chance to test it out, and I gotta say, I especially love the four-player variant. Listen, the more dragons throwing elemental breath through the air and trying to maneuver around each other, the better. The mechanics are easy to learn, but with a high skill ceiling as you learn to predict what everyone else is gonna do. It's going up on Kickstarter soon, but it has actually been delayed a little bit since I last mentioned this game. Expect it in March or April. I'm gonna drop a dedicated video on the game when the Kickstarter is live. But until then, if you want to keep track of this project, sign up to the email list for notifications as the date comes closer. And if you want to test this thing out to see if it's actually worth your money, signing up to the email list also gives you access to the virtual tabletop with the playtest version of the game. The models are looking exceptional, as you would probably expect from a war game developer. The figurines are top quality and will ship with pre-painted or unpainted dragons according to your preferences, with more planned as stretch goals. If you're interested in this new take on an old concept, combining tactics, thrill, and also the soul of the old games, then you really owe it to yourself to check out the Dragon Strike Kickstarter. There's so much fun to be had with your friends, and also so much complexity and replayability. From the type of dragon you're riding, to the actual skill set of your rider. Unique breath attacks, multiple mission types, Dragon Strike is here to deliver the ultimate dragon combat game. I know you guys are gonna love it. Now, let's dig into NES Dragon Strike. Why do they insist on calling an entirely different game in an entirely different genre a port? Well, really, it just comes down to who made it. Westwood Studios was a legendary studio, best known for creating the Command & Conquer series. But more importantly for us on this channel, they also made the first two Eye of the Beholder games, thus making them responsible for what was essentially the most successful D&D video games pre-Baldur's Gate. But Westwood's story didn't begin there. And to understand why it made sense for them to outright remake a game entirely and call it a port, we gotta rewind to a time before Westwood even existed. Personal Home Computing, <laughs> we are going back far this time, technically started in 1971 with the Ken Back One. 
but similar to how the car industry technically existed back in the 1880s, the PC industry really didn't get going until years later when it had its Model T. Things started in earnest in 1977, with the release of a trinity of home computers from various manufacturers. The Apple II, the Commodore PET, and the TRS-80. A number of new models and PCs rolled out over the next few years, but prices remained high. The largest wave of adoption came in 1982 with the release of the Commodore 64. The great PC price crash the following year led to the Commodore 64 being the most sold computer of all time. With somewhere between 12 to 17 million units of these suckers going into people's homes. This mass adoption spree naturally had some strange effects on the early video game industry that was rapidly emerging. Very quickly, there was this strange bottleneck. As the decade rolled on, the largest mass of users were all still using tech from 1982 or older. The tech was rapidly advancing each and every year. Machines like the Macintosh in 84 and the Amiga in 85 were huge steps forward. But I mean, everyone had just dumped a ton of money on the Commodore 64 two years ago. So for most of the 80s, the critical mass of players were essentially using last-gen technology. This led to many video game companies focusing their development primarily on making games optimized for older computers that could be as much as a decade old in the case of the Apple II. This is the state of the video game industry when Westwood steps into the space. This was a company that wanted to play it safe. They were originally called Westwood Associates at this time, because they weren't actually sure if they were just going to get stuck developing business software instead of making games. Risk averse as they were, they didn't start out trying to make their dream game and, you know, hoping it worked out like many other companies were doing. Instead, Westwood started their journey as a company for hire to port video games to other systems. Now, as I said, many games were being built from the ground up to work on old technology like the Commodore 64, which meant that Westwood wasn't necessarily being hired to backport games or to convert them to peer technology. Westwood was mostly being hired to port these games forward to the higher tech, more advanced machines. But they basically stumbled into the position of being a next-gen developer whose job was to improve other people's games and get them looking good on higher tech. Here, let me demonstrate just how transformative Westwood could be. This is Fantasy III, The Wrath of Nicodemus, on the Apple II made by SSI in 1987. And this is the port Westwood made for the Amiga. Night and day, isn't it? Westwood wasn't so much a port company as they were what we would now call a company that specializes in remasters. In short order, Westwood's good work secured them opportunities to produce their own games. It started when they were asked to make Questron 2, and it continued from there. Battletech, Mars Saga, a Donald Duck game? By the late 80s, Westwood's era as a company that made ports was winding down. This is when SSI, the company that had the gaming rights to Dungeons & Dragons at the time, took Westwood under their wing and had them start developing D&D games. It started with Hillsfar, which... I mean, wasn't a great start, but Dragon Strike in 1990 was a solid indicator of just how far this next-gen developer was able to push the tech. And then we hit 1991. Westwood releases Eye of the Beholder, and now the name Westwood is plastered across all the early gaming newsletters and magazines. It is in this era, as a newly risen titan of a studio, that Westwood ports Dragon Strike from DOS to the NES. This was not really how Westwood made ports in the past. This was a hardware side grade at best, but not really. It was more of a downgrade. The NES just couldn't handle the kind of early 3D Westwood was getting out of DOS. There were a handful of 3D NES games, but they were certainly not of the technical caliber of the original Dragon Strike. Fortunately, Westwood was still well used to putting in the work for game ports. They were used to making ports that were flat-out improvements and were nearly always transformative. 
So facing down a platform that couldn't really handle their game, they were going to have to downgrade it. And that just wasn't how Westwood did things. So instead, they chose to port it by... Well, by making an entirely new and polished game that would work better on the NES. Now, despite Westwood doing a great job at producing what was essentially a Dragon Strike remake on a different machine and in a different genre, it certainly feels like they didn't quite have, you know, the passion for ports anymore. They had made this game before. And while there was certainly a lot of room for delivering on things that were weak in the original, Westwood mostly didn't do that. They made a solid little shoot 'em up with scaled back writing and art. They just seemed like they were kind of over this whole port thing, and they chose not to use this as an opportunity to polish up an IP that honestly kind of needed it. I guess who can blame them, really? They had so many cool new original projects coming up to work on. But we can save the nuances of why I feel a tad let down by this port until later in the video. For now, let's start laying out the details of the game itself. I mean, it's a shoot 'em up so I won't farm view time by over-explaining the genre. We've all played them to some degree over the years. You start the game with a simple choice of what dragon you want to play as. That's right, you're not a dragon rider this time, you're just a dragon. The first is a bronze boy who is fairly balanced. The second is silver, which is fast but frail and doesn't do much damage. Finally, there's also a big dummy thick gold dragon who moves slow but is tough and does big damage. I tried it first as the silver, but was immediately frustrated with how little my breath attack did to hurt the enemies. I restarted as the big gold boy and I never looked back. Controls are pretty simple here. Two breath attacks and then you've got left and right for turning. Then, to add a little bit of depth to the game, haha puns, you can use up and down to switch in and out of low and high altitude. It's just the two, low or high, nothing in between. And you'll need to manage those altitudes in order to hit certain enemies with your breath, avoid terrain obstacles, and even dodge incoming attacks. It serves to give this game a lot more complexity than you'd initially think from the simple layout. I do have one gripe here though, it uses flight sim logic. So you have to hit up to go down and down to go up, and I never really got used to it. Honestly, with only two depths, it may have just been better if these buttons were simply a depth toggle instead of needing to hit one direction specifically. Enemy attacks move remarkably quick, so you need to be fast on the elevation controls on many of these levels. Or do like FromSoft level studying of attack patterns to avoid getting hit. Fucking waterfowl! The biggest difficulty in this game is that it's incredibly punishing. Your breath attacks are related to your health. The higher it is, the harder and wider your attack spread hits. But that also means that as you take damage, it will get worse until you've got basically nothing but a pea shooter. The game is literally harder for the players who aren't as good at it. The result is that you can be doing great for a while, and then hit a sudden doom spiral that you can't recover from. This is a game that rewards perfection. To me, there's one thing that really sticks out from all of this. I mean, Dragon Strike is a pretty short game. I've spotted Let's Plays as short as 45 minutes. And all of what I've just outlined, a classic Nintendo title that requires fast reflexes and rewards near-perfect gameplay, I mean look, this game sounds like it would be incredible as a speedrunning category. At time of recording, I couldn't find any speedrunning sites with a Dragon Strike NES category. So if you're into that kind of gaming, or are looking to get into it, I mean, see if you can submit one. It's a game that seems really well suited for this. If not, you still may have fun with this game. It's actually two player. Moving off of gameplay, let me start by saying that I actually love how this game looks. It's top tier pixel art. I love how the dragons look in particular. The designs are so clean. Beyond that, props to the artist for making everything so readable and recognizable. This isn't one of those pixel games where it's hard to tell what you're looking at. They even made pixel beholders and you can still tell what you're looking at even when they're at low altitude. I cannot emphasize enough how impressive that is. Complementing that, the color choices are perfect. Everything pops and contrasts. Look at this space map too, I mean just, just look at it! 
beautiful game right from minute one. The audio is up to the same par, though obviously very Nintendo sounding. Still, it never manages to sound too silly or dissonant to the game, so that's a plus. The music is, I mean, in my opinion, a slight downgrade from the original, kind of losing its identity to a more Nintendo sound. But on the other hand, Flight Sim Dragon Strike barely used its own music, while the NES has it ever present. The story, or perhaps the lack of it, is where the most interesting talking point is. The storyline is mostly the same as the original, but extended a bit. In both games, you fly around participating in mostly unconnected military objectives during the War of the Lance. The DOS game gives branching paths involving joining different knightly orders, but this is omitted in the NES version. The extended story of the NES game involves you opening up a portal after defeating the armies of evil and killing Takhesis herself. This is, this is, this, this is not canon. Neither of these games is very big on story, which is why I never really went over it in the original video. But while it lacked narrative, the OG Dragon Strike had tone. There was plenty of writing before and after each mission, and when you'd hit game over, it would outline the consequences of your failure and what it meant for you to fail at this specific mission. All of this writing outlines who you are and your place in the war. Now, I'm gonna end up covering Dragonlance in full in other videos when the time comes, but what you need to know right now is this. The bad guys have had dragons for years and have been training their riders for all of that time. The side of good only just got dragons like a couple months ago. Your place in all of this is that you're just some squire. You were given three days of training, and now you're paired up with dragons that are all on like their 17th rider, because the evil army just keeps slaughtering you guys en masse. It's desperate, it's dark, and it's super cool. Every time you die in the first half of the game, the game over screen tells you in various ways that you barely mattered anyway, and they're just gonna stick some other chump on your dragon to replace you. It's not a power fantasy like you would expect from a dragon riding game. I describe Dragon Strike's tone as Dragon Stalingrad, and I stand by that. Now the problem of all of this was that the tone of it only really came through from the text. The actual game was incredibly ambitious for the hardware at the time, and it just couldn't really match its presentation up with all of that prose it was writing. I was actually very excited to try NES Dragon Strike. I had hoped that by toning down the gameplay format to something easier to pull off with early 90s tech, I hoped they might have had a better chance to deliver on the hellish, grim tone of the original. Instead, Instead, they just scrapped that tone entirely. Where once we received a little prose at the start and end of each mission, or when we died, we instead get a much shorter paragraph at the start of each mission, basically just telling you what your objective is. See, that's why I say at the beginning of all of this that it felt like Westwood had moved on from this game. They released a game that was very, very good on a technical level, but they kind of ripped out the heart of it. It actually kind of hurts me that when they were tasked with fixing up a game that had such a cool tone but couldn't quite land it, their solution was just to remove that cool writing. Yeah, uh, I mean, okay, I guess everything matches now. Yeah, bland matches with bland. That hurts me. I hurt now. They can't do this to me. Westwood was a company that produced high-quality next-gen ports and excelled at it. But that era had passed. Their creativity was going into their new games, which, as sad as I am that Dragon Strike's promised vibe will continue to live on unfulfilled, I mean, it was probably for the best that they saved their best work for their original titles. By the mid-90s, reportedly Westwood was making up as much as 5% of the entire video game market. 
So yeah, they focused on the right stuff, I'm just salty. But from a gameplay point of view, Dragon Strike is still absolutely worth your time. Thanks for watching everyone. This is one of the shorter videos I've ever made, so it'd be a big help if you took a second to like the video. YouTube doesn't really like it when I keep the runtime respectful. We'll be back in a few weeks to cover Wraith Afterlife, and finish my little intro trilogy for the World of Darkness.